Today, we explore a beautiful residential metal roofing project located in Missouri with architect Steve Basic of the Build Show Network. What's up guys, welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel. I'm Thad Barnett, make sure you subscribe if you're new. We release metal roofing and metal construction content every Monday and Wednesday. I'm really excited to talk about this residential metal roofing project. It's located in Missouri and it's a project that Sheffield Metals did in conjunction with architect Steve Basic of the Build Show Network. Steve, thank you so much for joining us here on the Metal Roofing Channel. Really appreciate you taking the time. No problem. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Sheffield Metals uh, did a project um, with you and, and Matt uh, in, a, in Missouri. And can you tell me a little bit about it, what it was called and kind of the basic build? Yeah. I mean, we referenced the project as the Hilltop Arrow Project. It's basically on a hilltop and it's being built by a company, Arrow Building, out of Columbia, Missouri, headed by Jake Bruton. I mean, it's a pretty cool project aesthetically. It's, you know, about 60% of the building is on concrete piers and there's a small basement complement, but they're, they're single slope shed roofs for the most part. We do have one small flat roof section. But the, the interesting thing that I think is uh, most notable about the project is there's an enormous amount of building science to be had that's being knitted together with the aesthetics of this project. So it's a really great example of building science in general. There's, there's just so many little pieces to it. Absolutely. And kind of in as, as an architect, can you talk about the balance between that aesthetic value of the home and the building science and everything that goes into that? Yeah, I mean, I could sum it up in a little quote that I always use, and then we can dive in a little deeper, but I say it should perform as good as it looks, right? One of the things about buildings, in, and specifically residential buildings in America, is we're very concerned about how do they look, right? And what are the materials that we touch and see? Well, those are important, certainly. But those are what people reference because that's kind of what they think makes the building. You know, if I see it and it looks cool, then it is cool. Um, the, the, the things that get hidden in the wall or, you know, a roof that you might not see, it might not be as cool as the roof you do see or the roof lines you do see. But the, the reality is, is that, you know, another one of my quotes that I use all the time is, is if it doesn't last, it doesn't matter. Meaning that you can have the prettiest building, but if it's if it's not handling basic water management and thermal management and vapor management problems well, then it's just a good building that's going to end up in a dumpster in a very short life that we really need to pay attention. And, and you know, as, as an architect, there's certainly a moral question at hand that suggests, okay, you're designing a building. Should I design it for five years, 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years, right? And if I design it for 10 years, it means that we've pulled all these resources from all over to this one location to build what we call a house. And if it only lasts 10 years, well, then what really have we done? We've probably created more of a problem than anything. But if that building lasts 50 or 100 years, then those resources, you know, they're, their value goes up much higher. And I'd love to get into some of the details of the construction as well. But first, can you tell me a little bit about uh, what kind of climate is expected in that area and kind of how that played into some of the building science? I mean, it's a it's a climate zone four, which means that they do have some modest heating there, but it also has a lot of cooling and humidity that comes with that climate. So you're dealing with pretty much everything over the course of the year. Um it's just that the scale of heating to cooling, say from where I live in Boston, it shifts from predominantly heating to, you know, more, more cooling requirements than heating requirements, right? And, and one thing that, you know, and I know you're the one answer, asking questions here, but I don't know if you even know it, um, you know, that, that roof in some ways has made history in the sense that it's a one in 12. And I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, you never really want to vent a roof under a three and 12 because they don't vent. And so I worked again with Jake and, and, you know, you guys 
um, answered a bunch of questions for us, but we developed a venting strategy for that one in 12 roof. And we were not only good enough with, you know, the, the prediction that it's going to work well. When we had Peter Yost out there, we had him with some of his toys, theatrical fogger and all of this stuff. And we actually tested the roof. And so we had a 32 foot length of one in 12 roof that vented in about 20 seconds, 28 seconds, I think it was. It vented so fast that we weren't prepared with the camera to video it. We had to wait a while for all the smoke to disappear and then redo the study and be prepared because we just, we weren't expecting it to, to work that fast. Right. So we, we have a one in 12 roof out there and it's a metal roof and it vents. And I would, I was just about to ask, you know, what unique features did this project present? And I think you answered that. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible to have, have that kind of accomplishment with that roofing system uh, to be able to vent like that. But that's testament to the team. I'm not, I'm not saying it in, in, in such a way that every architect now can go out there and say, Hey, let's build a one in 12. Steve said that you can vent it. Let's just do it venting. We did, there, there were some specific strategies to that roof system that allowed for that. But, um, but the, the reality is, is that we have a vented roof less than a three and 12. So, and it's got Sheffield metal roof on it, you know, as, as an architect and, and as a client and as a builder, I, I think, you know, any, anybody that's attached to the industry in whatever capacity, whether you're buying the house, building the house, designing the house, you know, the, the reality is, is the, the world we love to think in, in terms of sustainability and, and green, you know, building and this and that. Well, the reality is, is the minute I commit to building a house, I'm kind of anti-sustainability and anti-green, right? I mean, you take this house, for example, before we got there, it was, you know, grassy tree wooded lot at the top of a hill. We went in there, we cut down some trees, we got rid of some grass and we put a foundation in. Nothing about that is better than the way it was. So, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't build because that's not really a sustainable effort for our culture either. But what I'm saying is, is that all of us, clients, homeowners, and builders have a commitment, a moral commitment to doing it the best that they can. And then that means teaming up with the right people, putting the right materials on there, looking at things like how long will it last, not just how good does it look or how much does it cost. Granted, those, those, those are parts of the puzzle, but the reality is, is you know, the, those shouldn't be the only questions at the top of the page. And, you know, again, searching out materials that like your roof that is going to last a long time. We, we understand that we're not going to be sustainable with our decision to build a house, but can we make the most of all the decisions along the way to benefit the project the best that we can, right? And have the least impact on, on the fact that we cleared this treetop wooded site or hilltop wooded site to put a house on it right? To try and give back as much as we can, knowing that we're not going to give back hundred percent, but giving back 50 or 75% is better than giving back 10%. And about the uh, metal roof specifically, what system was installed? And can you tell me a little bit about the installation of the roof itself? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's the metal, your metal standing seam roof with the uh, lock seams there, you know, the house was designed for a low slope roof. And uh, in this case here, it's a one in 12. So it's, you know, it's just good enough, I would say, to move water in a positive direction relatively fast. So it's not going to, you know, you're not at the risk of ponding or something like you are with a flat roof, but it's not shedding rain or snow like a nine and 12. But it, in looking for it, there, there were a number of things at hand. And when I talk about aesthetics and performance, you know, talking with the homeowners, we were looking for a material that it, it has to look right on the house. It, it has to look like it's part of the recipe, right? It can't be, uh, it can't be a vinegar in your recipe unless you need it. Um, it. It has to look like it belongs. And 
with that, then it has to perform. So we want it to last long because we just talked about, you know, getting it out there and, and having it last for more than 10, 20, 30 years. But it also has to perform well and get rid of that water at a one in 12, be able to handle the light snowfalls and such that they do get out there. You know, the metal roof, you know, it's, it's, it's a great option. I think it's a great option whenever I'm designing buildings. I, I like them. I favor them. You know, their, their longevity. I tell people, you know, they, they try and make the argument, well, it costs, you know, the metal roof is, is more than say other roofing options. I said, but it's an investment. You're, you're not paying for, just a more expensive roof, you're paying for the subsequent roofs that would get replaced with other materials. So instead of buying a 15 year plan that's getting replaced, you know, every 15, 20 years, you are buying the 50 year plan. So essentially, in, in some cases where it might be three times the cost of say another roofing material, it's going to last four times as long. Over the life of the material, it's certainly a a wise investment, but it's that it's the upfront cost is becomes the hurdle with metal. You get immediately, you get color options, you get aesthetic options as to is the metal corrugated? Is it a standing seam? What type of aesthetic specifically is that metal roof uh, looking like? And, you know, from a building science perspective, metal roofs work very, very well. You know, they, they shed the water, Um, They're highly durable. They're pretty easy to install. Their installation system is a blind fastening system. So you're not, you know, at the risk of getting water intrusion. Everything is lapped properly and sealed properly. It's, it is, you know, it, it goes back to my original adage there that I talked about that it, it's a roof that performs as good as it looks. Um, So as far as color options go, uh, how did the aesthetic of the roof uh, match the aesthetic of the rest of the building. Yeah, so we actually had a lengthy uh, uh, time with the clients there because they were having just a hard time understanding what uh, what the color palette that they favored was. And we ended up going with some earthy tones of uh, you know green and, and dark gray, where the dark uh, gray metal roof, charcoal gray that we use there, it fell right into place perfectly with our scheme. And again, that's one of the beauties of metal roof is that, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly how many, but Sheffield metal probably has 10 grades, right? So that it, it allows me to find one that falls where I need it to fall. Yeah, very true. And, and we love talking about colors here on the metal roofing channel. Um, as you said, you know, it's a, it's a huge benefit of metal to be able to look at a color chart and just see the vast array of options that can fit with pretty much any exterior uh, of, of a home or building. Talk to me about this. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear about your daily role in the project and um, for our viewers who may not be familiar with, with how uh, you know architecture and design works in a residential setting, can you talk to me about that a little bit? The, the beauty of this project and my relationship with Arrow Building and Jake is that most of our work is what we consider design build, which means we're both at the table for discussion. And the, the, the beauty of that, as opposed to, say, working with a client, developing drawings and putting them out to bid, is that we get the insight and builder experience to aid in answering the questions at hand. And while I feel very confident in, in being able to answer these, it's always helpful just to have another set of eyes and ears at the table. We're all going to learn something there and and everybody sees something a little different, right? The builder seeing it, how am I installing this? When am I installing this? What does that end detail look like? How does this get vented at this end? What kind of profile are we looking at? So they bring their set of questions to the table. The homeowner, you know, um, they're just sitting there saying, well, I wonder what color and what, you know, what it's going to look like. And, and I'm trying to knit all of that together, that we have to provide a color and a, a material that the homeowner finds favorable. I need to work with the builder to ensure that the installation goes smoothly and that 
it's one of the lowest risk possible, which, you know, cause they don't want to be out there. You guys don't want to be out there replacing it in a year or something because a panel blew off or whatever the case is. So we have to make sure that, you know, our, our installation process and, and stuff is thoroughly vetted. And so that's all part of my role and going out there and just, just like sitting at the table in the meeting, going out to the job site, walking around and, and checking out the roof ensures that just another set of eyes took a look at it. And, and again, just like in conversation, the builder, you know, can go there and, and see the roof every day for three or four weeks. And I show up and say, Hey, what's happening in that corner? And it's like, Oh, how did I miss that? Right. It's yeah. we've, we've all experienced writing a, a paper in school and glossing over you know, that grammar mistake or whatever, because it's become old hat and you tend to see the mistake as a correction in your eyes just because you've read it so many times. Well, the same thing can potentially happen in construction. You're, you're looking at that corner so much that you see it as a solution, not as a problem. And then someone else comes and sees something and questions it and you go, well, how did I not see that before? You know, that's just human nature at work. So ha having that design build relationship, it, it works great for everybody because it's minimizing everybody's risk because we're getting more people looking at it, more people questioning it, et cetera. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the roofing contractor, um, who was a superb contractor, by the way, that you guys uh, had recommended, I'm sure he looked at a couple of things and said, yeah, that would work, but this is how we always do it. And I think it's a slightly better way to finish this at the end of the roof or up here, whatever the case is, we're, we're all on that learning curve and we're all getting something out of it every time we do something. For our viewers that don't know, um, Steve has some great videos on buildshownetwork.com and I was watching uh, your bio video actually, a little bit about your background and you said something interesting that, you know, you came from a building science background into architecture. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that's kind of shaped you? Yeah. So when I graduated um, college, I actually started working for a large architecture firm. It was pretty much a, a traditional trajectory for an architect. But then I had an opportunity to go work for a company that was, uh, the company was just starting out. It's, it's headed by a gentleman, Joe Stebrick, who most people in the building industry know and know well. But Building Science Corporation was just being formulated as a company and they were looking for an architect and, and hiring. And I had a friend that had, had an association with them and gave my name. And lo and behold, I took the job working at Building Science Corporation when they were newly formed as a company and worked there for right around 10 years. And so I tell people it's it's just like I spoke of, it's, it's, you know, the series of filters in which we perceive things. Working there and working with people like Joe and Betsy, um, the owners of the company, but there's a whole host of other building science people that I was associated with, right? The, the Coda Wenos, Peter Yost, Nathan Yost, John Straub. These are all guys that understand buildings far better than you know, most, most people in the country, right. for sure. And just to walk shoulder and shoulder with them and have conversations, you pick up tidbits here and there, and then you draw this detail and you learn about vapor transmission or diffusion and air leakage. And, um, you know, Joe has a whole series of books that I did all the details for and drew them up. So when you're working with Joe and you're having a discussion about how do you battle air leakage in a building and this and that, or water management, then, you know, you have to learn something. I mean, you're sitting next to the, the, the smartest guy in the building science world and, uh, and he's telling you, you know, how it is, then yeah. you get one hell of an education. And, um, and that's certainly a non-traditional role for, for most architects. I mean, even today, I'm, I'm pretty amazed at how little building science architects have. And it's, it's part of our education system for architects, et cetera. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting to say the least. I won't 
condemn them. But but my daughter who works with me, she just graduated about a little over a year ago and is working with me. And you know, her her level of building science is probably even in that year and a half, she's probably where most architects in the 30 years of their career are in understanding building science, um, just because it, the projects that we work on are heavily laden in building science and understanding of things like durability and moisture management, et cetera. So, and most of my clients, they, they search us out because they know that the buildings that we build, we're, we're not building solely for looks. We're putting together buildings that look and perform equally and that are going to be around a long time. They're not going to have a, a water management problem in three years or mold growing on their walls in the basement and, you know, next summer. Um, we're, we're not going to have those issues. So, Steve, in the realm of, you know, metal roofing manufacturers and suppliers and, and an architect thinking about going down the metal roofing route in their designs, what are some pieces of advice that you would give them when seeking out a company like that? You know, it's it's really interesting because it, this is somewhat of a, a gray area, in and it's and it's a gray area in such that, you know, some architects would look for companies that they want them to do their job, right? Like, hey, I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell the builder we're gonna use this metal roof, and then you work with them. In my recommendation is that. You know, so someone has to be the, the maestro of the project or somebody has to drive the bus is what I usually say, right? And, and there can only be one driver of the bus. And it's not, I don't say that in an egotistical manner. I say it in a sense that you can't, you can't be efficient if certain things are left to certain people and this is left to that person and this is left to that person because you start losing accountability and the ability to hold accountability, right? So the whole reason you have a bus driver is, is yeah, they drive the bus, they tell it where to go, but they're also maintaining, you know, order and discipline on the bus for all the, all the people that are riding along. So an architecture project is very similar. I'm providing the direction upon which the project is going, you know, with consulting with my clients. But I'm looking back consistently on all the people that are riding on my bus and trying to make sure that they're doing what they say they're going to do. They're answering the questions that I need them to answer, and they're providing the information or suppliers or installers or material and scheduling, all these things. And, and, and the same with the general contractor, right? He's sitting right behind me on the bus because... All of these things are eventually falling into his lap and getting passed on. So when you're looking for someone, you know, one of the, the, the things I, I loved about working with Sheffield Metals is, is that, you know, your team was responsive. They answered the questions when we had. They didn't feel like they needed to take charge of the project. They took charge of what we asked them to take charge of and provide those answers and and the right people to do the job. So, you know, not only did you guys provide the product, but you guys provided the recommendations for the installers and such, which is huge because I don't, you know, I don't know who a good metal roof installer in Columbia, Missouri is, but, you know, to have you guys on the team and provide that information, it makes us all look good. And that's when I say all look good, meaning we're all put in the position for success and we all come out with a win, which is what we're trying to do for our clients. All right, Steve. Well, thanks so much. I learned a lot about building science and really enjoyed talking with you about the Hilltop Aero Project and how we could partner there and really create something special for the homeowners. Can you tell us where people can find you online? Yeah, so that th this might be as long as the interview there, my friend. <laughs> Um, no, uh, online, you, I mean, the quickest down and dirty, you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Stephen Basic Architect there. Um, I put up information daily, trying to share it. You know, one of the things I feel is that, you know, we're, we're curators of knowledge. We're not owners of it. And so we should be sharing it and we should all benefit from the, the positives and negatives of the work that we do, right? Um so yeah, Instagram, Steve Basic Architect. You can find me, like you said, on the Build Show Network. 
I drop one video every Friday on some aspect of a project that we're working on. So sometimes building science related, sometimes architectural or aesthetically related, et cetera. I also have a, a podcast that I uh, share with colleagues, Jake Bruton, and uh, who's the builder of Hilltop Arrow, but uh, Peter Yost, also um, noted building scientist. It's called the Unbuild It Podcast. You can find it through all the normal channels. You can also find it. We recently moved to YouTube, so you get to see the the, the video of the antics behind the scenes of uh, those guys trying to beat up on me. But, uh, you know, it, it's we, we have a lot of fun there, but there's a lot of great information that, you know, both Peter Yost and I worked at Building Science together. That's where I met him. So we have a strong building science background. We just basically take what people might consider some pretty tough topics and we give our points of view. I mean, Peter's been doing this for over 30 years. I've been doing it for 30 years and Jake's probably 20 plus years. So you have a good handful of experience there. And more importantly, you have three different sets of eyes that are looking at it totally differently. So you get you, we, we get some really good commentary out of it because of the way we see things. Well, thank you so much again, Steve. And you heard him. Check out Steve Basic online. Comment down below if you have any questions. Subscribe here to the Metal Roofing channel. And as always, I'm Thad Barnett. We'll catch you next time.